In Hebrews 10, the author talks about how futile the sacrificial system is when it comes to accomplishing atonement. When bringing this up to a person who holds to the temple being rebuilt and the sacrifices starting again, they mention that even Paul made sacrifices to defend this position in Acts 21. Yeah, that's, that's that's very poor logic, you know, on the part of of those who would do that for a number of reasons. But let's, I'll, I'll get to those. But let's talk about the sacrifice, you know, quote unquote, the offering that Paul brings in Acts twenty one. The the question itself, and I'm not saying the the questioner, but but just this question, bringing Acts into this picture, and then talking about renewing sacrifices in a new temple. The question itself sort of presupposes that Old Testament sacrifices had something to do with forgiveness in a moral sense. And the series on Leviticus, I think, made the point many times that in the overwhelming number of cases, that isn't in view at all. Sacrifices were about making someone fit for sacred space and, or taking care of ritual uncleanness, you know, taking away the possibility of polluting sacred space so that God wouldn't be offended or, quote, driven away or God wouldn't, you know, withdraw. So it, it, it's not about, I, I did something wrong and I feel bad, so... I'm going to bring this this animal and kill it so that God will feel differently toward me and forgive me. The sacrifices are really about, okay, you messed up here. And because you messed up, you're going to pollute sacred space. You're going to pollute the people around you. And that, then they're going to pollute sacred space. You know, we, we we can't have this. We have to have the presence of God. I mean, God is, is here to, to dwell with us. We need to have the place that is God's domain be utterly different and kept utterly different. Uh, again, because there's a difference between him and you. This is the system that he has set up. If you want him to be with you, this is these. This is what we have to do. So it was. It was about sacred space. It wasn't about the individual bringing an offering, you know, in in that sense. But the, but the question kind of I think distorts that. Now, when when we went through Acts on the podcast, we noted that there were a number of possible interpretations of what Paul did. You know, the, the, the most common one is probably the Nazarite vow. Uh, I, if, if listeners recall, I went to uh, Daryl Bach's commentary, and I'll, I'll, I'll read a little bit of, of that here again when he comments on the Nazarite view, which again is just one of, of several views. I'm, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to really focus here on two items instead of four, three or four. But the purification for Paul, Bach says, is to restore purity, Okay, after he has traveled in Gentile areas. So again, we're, we're, we're far afield from this moral salvation kind of thing that we associate with the work on the cross. Okay, Jesus didn't die so that you could be clean because you went into a Gentile area. All right, it, it, it's, it's quite different. Purification uh, that, that Paul offers, again, is, is most likely for this reason. Now, sometimes, you know, you... That that might have been associated with a Nazarite vow, but typically Nazarite vows, you know, were not associated with that. What I'm going to do here is I'm going to talk about the Nazarite option and then this idea of restoration of purity. That they could be related, but we're going to consider them, uh, you know, differently. So let, if it's the Nazarite vow, then Nazarite vows typically lasted for 30 days. Again, it, it, at least according to the you know rabbinic literature of the time of the New Testament era. In this view. Nazarite view, the payment for sacrifices that Paul does in Acts 21, verse 26, and the shaving of the head would be part of the observance of the law about the Nazarites, which we get in the book of Numbers. That's Numbers 6, basically verses 2 to 21, most of the chapter there. Now, it could refer again to restoring purity generally, but they could be separate things, as I mentioned. Let me just read Numbers 6. Uh, through 11. If any man dies very suddenly beside him, he defiles his consecrated head, that he shall save his head on the day of his cleansing. On the seventh day, he shall shave it. On the eighth day, he shall bring two turtle doves or two pigeons to the priest at the entrance of the tent of meeting. And the priest shall offer one for a sin offering and the other for a burn offering and make atonement for him because he sinned by reason of the dead body. And he shall consecrate his head that same day. Now that that's part of the Nazarite vow. You'll notice that the quote unquote sin is not moral. It's touching a dead body. And we've already talked, uh, again, in our series in Leviticus about how the quote-unquote sin offering actually refers to a purification offering, or as people liked, liked my phrase, decontamination offering. That's what it was. It was not about moral forgiveness, again, in the way we think about Jesus on the cross. So I think, again, the original question sort of distorts that or doesn't, doesn't recognize that distinction. The burnt offering, of course, had nothing to do with, with moral guilt. 
moral culpability. The burnt offering was what you would you would give, you know, to go visit the Lord. This the whole burnt offering idea. So the Nazarite vow, if that is indeed what Paul is doing here in Acts 21, has nothing to do with the kind of of moral atonement and moral forgiveness that that the New Testament associates with what Jesus did on the cross. It's about decontamination and becoming clean from, you know, becoming infected ritually by touching a dead body. Now, it's actually not clear that the Nazarite vow is in view with what Paul's doing. People go there mentally because of the shaving of the head. It makes them think of the Nazarite vow. But three chapters prior to Acts 21, where we see Paul going into the temple and doing this vow, in Acts 18.18, 18, there is this comment about Paul uh, having spent a lot of time in Gentile territory. It, it, Acts 18.18 18 says, After this, Paul stayed many days longer and then took leave of the brothers and set sail for Syria with him, Priscilla and Aquila. At Sencrea, he had cut his hair for he was under a vow. Again, so you have a couple issues here. This is sort of a making a point that Paul had been among Gentiles in Gentile territory for a while. And he actually has the hair cut before he ever gets to Jerusalem. So, you have to wonder, well, it wasn't the cutting of the hair like at the end of the Nazarite vow? You know, so you, you could read that and say, well, the fact that Paul cuts his hair earlier, and when you get to Acts 21, he isn't the one cutting his hair, by the way. It's the other, it's the other guys who are said to cut their hair. You could say, well, maybe, you know, maybe this is not a Nazarite vow. Now, now, having said that, Josephus, at least in one place, does point out that the way Jews practiced the Nazarite vow during that time was that, it, that some of them did cut the hair before offering the sacrifice. In other words, before the final phase of bringing the quote-unquote sin offering or the quote-unquote burn offering uh, again. So that it, it's possible that even though Paul cut his hair three chapters earlier, you know, that doesn't really disqualify what he's doing from being a Nazarite vow, but it isn't really clear. There's just ambiguity there. Now, I think the alternative again, is sort of to divorce this from the number six passage, uh, the Nazarite situation. Head shaving was also associated with taking more personal vows. In other words, something between you and the Lord. Uh, it, It could even be for thanksgiving. Again, it doesn't have to be necessarily for any kind of moral violation. So the offerings of Acts 21, 26 may have nothing to do with number six and the Nazarite vow. We just don't know. Bach, of course, as I read you know, a few minutes ago, favors the uh, the general you know restoration to purity because Paul had been in Gentile territory. To me, that does make a lot of sense. Uh, he doesn't want to go into the temple, of course. If, if he does go into the temple, he has to do it under these circumstances because of the Gentile contact. In, let me let me just let me just pull out one one statement here from Josephus or or about Josephus. Gentiles were not allowed, according to Josephus in Antiquities. This is fifteen eleven five, uh, the, you know the book fifteen eleven, you know section, so on and so forth. Gentiles were not allowed into the main temple area, and they could be put to death if they were caught there. They actually have. This is Bach now. Bach says that four and a half foot tall stone markers inscribed in Greek and Latin in the outer court that surrounded the court of women, again, this is the New Testament temple, announced to foreigners that they were prohibited from entering the sanctuary. Two of those notices have actually been found. And they read, quote, no foreigner may enter within the barricade which surrounds the temple and the enclosure. Anyone who is caught trespassing will bear, bear personal responsibility for his ensuing death. Unquote. So it was a serious thing to bring Gentiles in. You say, well, why do why do we mention that? Because if you go to the Acts twenty one instance, you know Paul gets accused of doing that. Now he hadn't actually done it, but Paul gets accused of doing that. I mean, they they accuse him of teaching against the people, against the law, against the temple. They say he brought Greeks into the temple. They apparently suppose that he had brought Trophimus of Ephesus into the temple area, because that's one of the guys he's traveling with, a Gentile. That's in Acts 20, verse 4. So, you know, there's this whole thing about bringing a Gentile into the temple, but they also add this accusation that he has defiled the temple. And that charge, again, this is Bach, and I think, I think again, this makes sense. That charge may have extended from Paul's stay in Gentile territory, according to Acts 18. Now, that's a very long and convoluted way of saying, look, At the end of the day, it doesn't matter if it's a Nazarite vow or some other vow that concerned ritual purity. Both the Nazarite vow and those other vows were not about moral transgressions. They were about 
incurring impurity on your person. And if you go back to the Old Testament impurity laws, that's why you got a purification offering. I'm sorry it's translated sin offering because it makes it sound like a moral violation. Okay, that, that is not the point. And of course, if it's Nazarite, you had, had to have a burnt offering in there, again, to approach God and have him accept you. But it's not for moral violation. It specifically says in Numbers 9, it's because he, had, you know, he touched a dead body. Okay, or he had you know, touched something else that he wasn't supposed to touch. It's about, again, this ritual impurity kind of state. Now let's go from that to this larger question of bringing back the sacrifices. I'll admit up front, this is a bit of, this is a theological pet peeve with me because this makes no sense at all. If the sacrifices are brought back, then the writer of Hebrews was wrong. He made an error because the writer of Hebrews has the work on the cross covering past, present, and future people, sinners, all of us. There is absolutely no coherent rationale for bringing back sacrifices post-Jesus. What would their purpose be? They can't be to atone for moral forgiveness, because that would be covered by the cross, oh, unless the writer of Hebrews made a boo-boo. Okay, I would suggest that if that's the case, then you, the person who is, you know, who's saying hey, the sacrifices are going to come back. I don't know what the basis of your salvation is then, because if the writer of Hebrews is wrong, then maybe you aren't covered. Maybe you aren't. Your sins haven't been atoned for. Maybe you'll be lucky enough to live during the sacrificial era when it comes. Again, these are absurdities. Now, what usually happens is people who defend this idea usually argue that renewed sacrifices are somehow a memorial of the cross a reminder of what the cross meant or what had happened at the cross, uh, what, what, what Jesus' death meant. We bring back animal sacrifices to, to somehow teach this object lesson, to help instruct Jews or maybe other people about what happened on the cross. Okay, that is logically and theologically absurd for a couple simple, straightforward reasons. If Jesus' sacrifice covered us, those of us who lived well after the cross event, why wouldn't it cover anyone else who lived after the cross event, including people who are living later in a millennium? It's usually the literal millennialist crowd that argues for a literal temple needing to be rebuilt. And then, of course, you have to have sacrifices because what's the point of having a temple if you don't do sacrifices and all this kind of stuff? Well, hey, all those people who lived during the millennium and afterwards, guess what? They lived after the cross just like you are. So why are you covered and they're not? doesn't make any sense. Why would people need sacrifices as a reminder of the atonement of Jesus? Here, I have a suggestion. Why not just hand them a New Testament and have them read about it? Why would anyone need sacrifices for understanding how Jesus fulfilled what needed to happen or, or, or fulfilled the typology of Old Testament sacrifices when they could just read it like you and I did? And with respect to modern Jews, they haven't needed the Old Testament law or the cross commemorated to become believers in the Messiah since the cross. You just give them the gospel. You hand them the New Testament. You speak the gospel to them, and they believe. They don't need a sacrificial system in place to comprehend the message of the gospel. What about Jews in the New Testament era living after 70 AD when the temple was destroyed? Guess what? They could still understand the gospel and still believe it and become followers of Jesus. Again, this idea that, that we need sacrifices either to atone for sin makes no sense. And it, doesn't, it, it, it also doesn't make any sense if the purpose of the sacrifice is to commemorate or memorialize the meaning of the cross. Hey, just hand them a New Testament. Why don't you tell them? Because that's how you and I learned it. And we were fully capable of embracing it or believing it or rejecting it. Again, th this, is, this is baggage that comes along with this insistence that a literal temple has to be rebuilt. rebuilt. I'll say something else here, but I'm not going to rabbit trail with it. You don't need a, a literal rebuilt temple to have an earthly kingdom. You can still have an earthly kingdom without the literal temple. In fact, at the end of the book of Revelation, it specifically says there is no temple. Okay, but setting that aside, you don't need to have Jesus coming back and ruling on the earth. You don't have to have a temple for that. You just don't. We, we tend to assume that, but the purpose of the temple is obsolete. We don't need the sacrifices, again, unless the writer of Hebrews is wrong, and, and other passages too. The New Testament is actually pretty clear about its use of temple language in association with Jesus' body, 
Spirit and the presence of God was in him, to say the least, and, of course, believers. That's why Paul says we are the temple. You are the temple, collectively and individually. Why should we look for a literal temple when 1 Corinthians 3, 6, 1 Corinthians 6, 19, 20 have believers individually and corporately as the temple of God? Uh, again, it, none of this just make this just doesn't make any sense. And here's here's the kicker: if you're a literalist reading the Book of Revelation, which again most of, of these this kind of millennialist is that wants to have the literal temple rebuilt. If you're literally reading Revelation 11, then guess where the temple is in Revelation 11? It's in heaven. It's what the text says. So the New Testament actually says that the temple is in heaven, but somehow we yet we need it back here on earth. Why? Again, I, I could go on for another half hour just bringing up points of, I'll well, just conundra, bringing up conundra for this view. And I know why it's out there. It's out there because of an over-literalizing of, of certain passages about the temple. And, and then, then you sort of have to ignore the way the New, the New Testament temple talk. And you have to kind of flinch, you know, about the writer of the book of Hebrews and all that stuff. But bringing this, using the sacrifices, using what Paul does as a, as a, as a wedge, you know, to argue this is really poor thinking. Because no matter what Paul did, whether it was Nazarite or something else, it had nothing to do with the kind of forgiveness, the kind of atonement that resulted from the work on the cross, as opposed to what you read in the Old Testament sacrifices. Again, those are largely just about purifying sacred space, making you fit so that you didn't pollute things that had been designated God's domain and God's turf.